Okay. All right, great. Well, hello and welcome everyone to We Demand, the suffrage road trip with Anne Gass. My name is Taryn Edwards and I am one of the librarians here at the Mechanics Institute of San Francisco. Um, for those of you who are unfamiliar with the mechanics, we are an independent membership organization that houses a wonderful library, the oldest in fact designed to serve the general public in California. We're also a cultural event center and a world renowned chess club that is the oldest in the nation. Right now, due to the continued pandemic, uh, many of our events are still virtual, but I um, urge you to consider becoming a member with us. Uh, our library is now open four hours a day, uh, Monday through Saturday, or sorry, Monday through Friday, and uh, membership is only $120 a year. And with that, you help support our contribution to the literary and cultural world of the San Francisco Bay Area. So our speaker today is Anne Gass, who considers herself a women's rights history activist. Uh, she is the author of We Demand, The Suffrage Road Trip, which is the um, novel we'll be talking about today. Um, it's based on a true story uh, of a 1915 road trip uh, cross country uh, for the suffrage cause. Her first book uh, was called Voting Down the Rose, uh, Florence Brooks, White House, and Maine's Fight for Women's Suffrage uh, was about her great-grandmother, uh, Florence, uh, and that was published in 2014. Uh, so we have at the Mechanics Institute, we have the novel We Demand, and um, I'm going to have to get a copy also of Voting Down the Rose, um, just so we have everything that Anne has written. Uh, Anne is also a frequent lecturer on suffrage history and is very active in promoting um, women's history and equality. Uh, and she serves as the vice chair of the Gray Town Council. Um, so we have a nice cozy group with us today. Um, I want to encourage uh, you, our audience, to please put your questions in the chat space and we will get to them at the end of Anne's um, presentation. And uh, are we, uh, let's see, I, I will also send out the link to the video um, to you uh, later this week um, if you want to watch it again. Are we ready, Anne? I think we're ready. Thanks for that, that introduction, Taryn. I really appreciate it. I'm excited to, uh, to be here with you all today. And I'm just uh, going to start the slideshow here. Uh, here we go from the beginning. Um, so, uh, as Taryn said, this is a, a book that's based on a true story of this epic cross country road trip uh, that took place in 1915. Um, I wanted to just do a shout out to my daughter, Emma Levitt, who was my illustrator for the cover and for the, in the chapter illustrations. So this trip in 1915 wasn't the first ever cross-country road trip by car, nor was it the first one ever to be completed by women. But it's notable for being the first ever undertaken for a cause, which of course was voting rights for women or suffrage. And women doing this kind of trip was still very much a novelty in those days. So just to give you some context here, uh, the, the trip was launched by something, by an organization called the Congressional Union for Women's Suffrage. Four women left San Francisco's Panama Pacific International Exposition for Washington, DC. Their mission is to deliver to Congress and the president this monster petition uh, with 500,000 signatures on it, demanding an amendment to the US Constitution and franchising women. And they're supposed to arrive on December 6th, the opening day of Congress, because there are big events planned that day. And, um, and they leave uh, San Francisco at the end of September. And just parenthetically, the reason why the petitions are such a big deal is that there's no polls in those days. It, it was really, they were the only way to represent the strength of women's demand for voting rights. Um, now, 
California, of course, already had uh, enfranchised women by 1915. Uh, and that's one of the reasons why they decide to launch the trip from there. Um, but I'll get into that a little bit more in a minute. So just let's sort of ponder this for a minute. In, in 1915, um, it's, it's been 67 years since the Seneca Falls Conference, which many people point to as the starting point for the suffrage movement. It's been 126 years since the constitution was adopted. Those are really long periods. And women uh, have really been talking about equality. You know, there have been some women, you know, a minority perhaps, but talking about equality and voting rights and other rights throughout that time period. And there's been some progress, but not a lot. And the thing is in 1915, they didn't know, um, is it gonna be another year before we get you know, a federal suffrage amendment? Is it gonna be five years, 10 years, 20? They, they really didn't know. And, and um, so women had come to the suffrage movement from other causes like temperance or labor, social work, uh, peace work. And they really wanted to get back to them. They were tired of suffrage. They were tired of arguing about it and they were tired of women having to prove over and over and again their their worth their you know their worthiness for the vote so the congressional union is this kind of upstart organization that was founded uh, co-founded by alice paul and by lucy burns um, in contrast to the what had been the primary suffrage strategy up until about 1913 or so they're focused entirely on winning in a, a federal amendment, amending the US Constitution to enfranchise women. And one of the strategies they're gonna to use to do that is to punish the political party in power for failing to move the federal suffrage amendment through Congress because Susan B. Anthony had arranged for the, this federal amendment to be introduced into Congress in something like 1898. Um, I, I mean, I have that date quite right, but still it had been quite a long time, but it had just been completely hung up in Congress. Um, it, you know, through procedural rules. And so in, in 1915, the Democrats had both the presidency through Woodrow Wilson and they had both the houses of Congress. So they're gonna punish the Democrats um, by encouraging women to vote against them in, um, in the 1916 election. That's kind of what this trip is about actually. Uh, it's a warning to the Democrats that if they don't pass it in the next session the, or make at least you know, substantial progress, the Congressional Union will organize the 4 million women voters of the West to vote against the Democrats in 1916. If they're successful, they could stop Wilson from being elected. So a few things, this is a graphic from the Congressional Union around this time. And uh, a few things to note about it, I mean, so the women voter, the, the equal voting states were all kind of west of the Mississippi. Um, and uh, they uh, are illustrated by these white states here. Uh, and this, this modern uh, woman voter is gonna come across the country to the aid of her benighted Eastern sisters here in the black pit of despair. A um, few things to note about this woman here, she's young. Uh, she's beautiful. She looks like a goddess. I mean, she's kind of wearing like a Greek goddess, you know, kind of wearing those robes. Um, and she's white. And, and those things are not an accident. That's this is very much the way that the suffragists at the time were trying to portray, you know, who would be the modern woman voter um, should the federal amendment be passed and, and ratified by the states. Uh, so you know, there, there certainly was a lot of racism in the suffrage movement. Um, it reflected the racism in the country as a whole. I don't think the suffragists were, you know, more racist than anybody else. They were simply, you know, grappling with the reality of, of a, a country that didn't value its, its citizens of color. So anyway, um, moving on, the, the, the plan here is they're going to launch this trip from the Panama Pacific International Exposition, because they know that millions of, of people are gonna be coming through this exhibit, uh, you know, to see the, the whole exposition. And they're gonna, some of them are gonna trickle into the Congressional Union's booth and sign their petition. So uh, this is their booth at the, oops, at the Panama Pacific. Uh, it's a little grainy, I'm sorry, but I had to kind of blow it up. 
And uh, you can see the what they call their great demand banner there that we demand an amendment to the United States Constitution and franchising women there at the back of the booth. And um, sure enough, they they are able to collect a lot of, of uh, signatures on their petition. And um, you know they're they're kind of they're getting their sort of ducks in a row here. They're getting ready. Uh, to do their next big event, which is they're going to have the first ever in the history of the world uh, convention of women voters at the exposition in mid-September. And they're doing this to uh, kind of unite women behind this strategy of going after a federal amendment. And there was a competing amendment at the time, I'm not going to go into that detail, but um, called the Shafroth Amendment, they were, that was causing a lot of confusion in the ranks. And so they really wanted to unite women around this, what they call the Susan B. Anthony Amendment, and, um, and get them excited about it. And they're going to launch the, the suffrage envoys east to Washington and, um, and meet with Congress and the president. So, uh, that's the plan, and they're they're really excited about it. You can see that this is the front cover of the Suffragist, which is the weekly newspaper of the Congressional Union. And over the course of the spring and early summer, there you can in 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 uh, the issues of the Suffragist, you can see that they're uh, they're talking about they're going to have a hundred women make this trip across the country. It's just going to be amazing. It's going to get all kinds of press. They're really going to draw attention to the fact that the majority of women in the country are not allowed to vote, and um, and and they're going to get this done. But the problem—it's a great idea; and everybody loves it. But the problem is, no one volunteers to make the trip, and so it's getting later and later. This convention's going to come up in September. They have no one to go, and suddenly one day uh, into their booth at the Panama Pacific wander these two women. Uh, Ingeborg Jeanstedt on the left and Maria Jinberg, who's behind the wheel. And they say, we'll do it. We'll take the petitions back to DC because we live in Providence and that's not that far from DC. And um, so we can do this. And so everybody's like, yay, was, you know, we, we're saved uh, because they say we're planning to buy this new car, this brand new car in San Francisco and um, and drive it back home. So they're, they were all ready to planning to make this trip so they didn't have to fundraise to cover their costs. They had a brand new car. Uh, you know, this Congressional Union had almost no money. So they were psyched that, that the Swedes, as they came to be called, were willing to make the trip. So I'm going to introduce you um, a little bit more to, to uh, who made this trip. Um, First up is Ingeborg, and, and um, she's, she was called the mechanician or the mechanic uh, for this trip. She was 50 years old at the, in 1915, um, and she was kind of a radical. Uh, she was a member of the Industrial Workers of the World. Uh, she was self-employed, um, and she was very independent. And in the book, this is how I describe her as a young woman. She's not that different in 1915. She wrote her life like a half-broken colt, plunging from one thing to another, curious and nippy, fighting efforts to rein her in. As time went on, Maria helped steady her, but she was always restless, alert for something new. And in 1915, I say she was a wild and grim thing with close-set, deep blue eyes startling out from her weather-beaten face, nose like a prize fighter, stubborn chin. Uh, so that's, that's Ingeborg. Um, and this is Maria. Uh, Maria actually purchased the car. She had her own business as well. She was a midwife. She was 55 years old in 1915. Um, she estimated she'd had this midwifery business for decades and estimated that she had delivered some 2,000 babies. Um, she was person, her personality was quite a bit different from Ingeborg's. Um, this is the way I describe her in the book. Maria was as frugal with words as she was with money. She said both were things you couldn't take back if you used them unwisely. She liked routine and didn't look for trouble, but could hold her own if it found her. Once Ingeborg had seen her verbally dismantle a cocky Coleman who'd tried to shortchange her on a delivery. Mostly though, she was easygoing and steady. So Sarah Bard Field um, ends up you know, having, she was the, the, the next person on the trip. She was kind of considered the envoy or one of the two envoys. Um, she lived in San Francisco. She was about 34 at the time of the trip. 
she was a hot mess. Um, she was divorced mother of two. The kids live with their father also in San Francisco. She was a bohemian and a poet, uh, a veteran of other suffrage campaigns, notably in, in Oregon and uh, Nevada. Um, but she was in frail health at the time of this trip. She'd had malaria over the summer. There was something wrong with her heart. I've never quite get, gotten to the bottom of, but it, she complained about it constantly. And she, she had other kinds of heart problems as well. She had kind of a broken heart because her lover, this man named Charles Erskine Scott Wood, or Erskine, as she called him, he, he was 30 years older than she was and lived with his wife and family in Portland, Oregon. And so they were separated and it really, she kind of ex experienced that as a kind of death. Um, Sarah professed to believe in free love, but Erskine really did. He was a serial philanderer and had a lot of uh, other lovers apart from her, even as he was married to his first wife. So much of what we know about the trip comes from Sarah. She wrote these voluminous letters to Erskine um, over the course of the trip. And, and uh, she didn't like Ingeborg and painted her in kind of unflattering terms. So the, the next, the fourth person on the trip was meant to be Frances Joliffe. She was the other envoy. She also was from San Francisco. She was a socialite, but um, was uh, you know part, part of this sort of prominent family, politically connected. She had campaigned extensively for Wilson in 1912, and that was one of the reasons why they wanted her on the trip. She was also supposed to be good at fundraising, but she made it only as far as San Sacramento, and then she dropped out and she didn't rejoin them until Albany, New York. Um, so she was uh, not really present during most of the trip. And then there's Mabel Vernon, uh, who was the advance organizer. And so her job was to sort of hopscotch across the country by train uh, ahead of the envoys and uh, set up these mass meetings in the larger cities and towns and set up uh, especially meetings with uh, congressional delegations because Congress was on break in September. Um, they wouldn't, re they wouldn't uh, you know, get back together in DC until December. So most of them were home in, in their districts and they would send these delegations of women to visit them and, and uh, kind of twist their arms around the, the federal amendment. So, uh, and Mabel was really quite amazing. She was from Delaware. She was just an incredibly hard worker, absolutely relentless um, and, and uh, really was responsible for a lot of the trip success. So lastly, I want to introduce the, this, the car as a character. And um, I have her, uh, this, you know, Ingeborg and Maria name her Emilia Ratu after a Swedish suffragist. Um, and she was brand new in, Sa in San Francisco. She was built by the Willis Overland Company out of Toledo, Ohio, who made a special push at the, um, to gain market share at the Panama Pacific by advertising extensively uh, and dropping their price. And, and they, they advertise in Swedish language newspapers, which may have been where Ingeborg and Maria find out about her. But anyway, um, you can see that she doesn't really have a top. Uh, she has no air conditioning, of course, no heat. And, um, and it's gonna be a tough ride across the country because they're heading across the Great Plains in the West, um, they're going up to high elevation. It's gonna be cold. Um, they're gonna hit rain and snow. It's really gonna be a rough trip. And, and here's, um, they're gonna be following, especially in the West, what was known as the Lincoln Highway. This was very aspirational in 1915. It, they hadn't really uh, got it sorted out yet. It was certainly not the cross, you know, country highway system that we know and love today. Um, the, the darker line is, is kind of the Lincoln Highway and the, the red line shows where they departed from it uh, to, to take in some additional states. So that's their, that's their plan. Um, and they, so they have this great launch in San Francisco and they make their way they, up through Sacramento, they lose uh, Francis Joliffe and then head across um, uh, into Nevada and, and Utah. And here's, uh, they have some adventures in the, um, the Great Basin in, in, uh, in uh, Nevada, Eastern Nevada. But here they are, and they make it to Salt Lake City. Um, and 
this looks this is very typical of the kinds of, of mass meetings they had this one was on the um, steps of the Capitol there and um, they would bring out all these um, women who had worked on suffrage in the past as well as uh, the mayor, the congressional delegation, the governor, if they could get them, whoever they could find and get these to these events. So that's a, then you could see they, they, they look a little burned up. Uh, they, they've come across the desert and it, it was a tough go, but they, they made it. Um, but the roads are not very good um, in those days. And, and one example is that they, um, oh, here, or oh, actually, I just want to mention they, they'd make it through Colorado Springs. Here's a, here's a, uh, I just love this photo because you can see how they look like they're ready to kill each other. And and uh, I don't know if you've ever done a, a long trip with with somebody. Even when you love them dearly, they can drive you mad. And um, and and you just want to be done with them. Um, and that's kind of the way they look in this photo. Um, the other woman in the car is is the is Bertha Fowler, who was chair of the Colorado branch of the Congressional Union. So anyway, I was talking about the mud, uh, you know, that they get into from time to time. And here they are. And this isn't their car. It's a it's a photo from very much the same period in Kansas. And they do get stuck in the in the mud in Kansas. And I'm just going to read you a quick excerpt of how this this goes. The mud was the real worry, though. In some sections, it came halfway up Amelia's tires and she had to plunge through one hole after another. Maria clung to the steering wheel, grim-faced, as Amelia turned along, slipping and sliding. They rode silently, listening to the sound of the engine laboring, all of them fluent now in the language of pistons and sparks and alert to any sign of distress. No one else was traveling this late at night, and aside from the occasional farmhouse, they were utterly alone. Without warning, Amelia's nose dropped, and there was a sickening slide into deep muck. Her engine wailed as Maria tried first to jam forward through the mud hole, then to reverse backward over the lip they'd just come down. No luck. After a death rattle, Amelia quit for good. Water began seeping through the floorboards as Maria ground on the starter, but the engine wouldn't catch. So how do they extricate themselves from that mess? Do they make it to DC on the appointed day and time? Uh, you'll have to read the book to find out. So I just wanted to sort of talk a little bit about how I got into this book. Uh, I learned about it in the course of writing my first book, which was, uh, as Taryn said, Voting Down the Rose, Florence Brooks White House and Maine's Fight for Women's Suffrage. And I, I always thought that it would just, it must have been an incredible trip and I wanted to learn more about it. Histories of the American suffrage movement often mention this trip, but only briefly. Sometimes they just give it a paragraph or two. And, and very often, Ingeborg and Maria are, aren't even mentioned. And when they are, we see them only through Sarah's eyes, which I said, uh, as I said earlier, was mostly unflattering. I mean, she didn't care for them and, and um, she didn't, especially Ingeborg, she didn't like. Sarah in, in the histories about this trip has always gotten the love. And, but I've been fascinated that people who've read the book have told me that they don't particularly like Sarah. They really love Ingeborg and Maria. So clearly it matters who's telling the story, who gets to paint the picture. Um, there's a quote from Nigerian author Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie that I really like where she warns of the danger of the single story and says, the single story creates stereotypes and the problems with stereotypes is not that they are untrue, but that they are incomplete. They make one story become the only story. And until the last five years or so, or maybe 10 years, the, the single story that had been told about the suffrage movement was the, from the perspective of white middle-class women like Sarah, and it was incomplete. Thanks to pushback and research from people of color and their allies, we've started to have a much richer and more complex understanding of the US suffrage movement from start to finish. In 2015, I spent eight weeks retracing their original route. And the question kept coming up, whose history was this? It clearly wasn't black history and not indigenous peoples because they weren't even considered US citizens until 1924. It, there were no Hispanics or Asian Americans on this trip and not a lot of labor, you know, working women or, or uh, working class women. And so that's part of what pushed me to tell this different version of the suffrage story. 
And ultimately, I wrote a novel because it was the only way I could think of to get away from that single story and tell it from the perspective of those who'd been othered and silenced. Writing it as a novel still allowed me to pay tribute to the grit and determination of the women who made the trip and the suffrage movement that launched it. So I wove together fact and fiction using the history of the actual trip as my training wheels. <clears throat> Despite my best efforts, I even went to Sweden. I wasn't able to learn much about Ingeborg and Maria. She's, they simply didn't leave the kind of written record that Sarah had left. Um, so I had to create their characters around the little I was able to find out about them. And here's some examples of how I did that. So we know from the census that Ingeborg and Maria lived together from at least 1895. So I made them romantic partners. They were lesbians, although there was no actual documentation of that. Not surprisingly, because people weren't act, you know, weren't trying to call attention to themselves around that in those days. But so-called Boston marriages were pretty common in the early 20th century, usually where two more affluent unmarried women lived together. So it could have been just that, but there was definitely a queer element in the suffrage movement. And in fact, Mabel Vernon and, and um, even Alice Paul, some people have, have sort of talked about them um, you know, being lesbians. Sarah and Mabel both described Ingeborg as irritable. I chose to reframe that as, as justified because even during the trip, she and, and Maria were kind of erased from the story. For example, newspaper coverage would only announce the arrival of Sarah and Francis sometimes, leaving out the Swedes entirely. And during that period when Francis wasn't even on the trip, newspapers would still talk about her as, as being present. Um, and that was because the Congressional Union didn't know when she would rejoin them. So they kept issuing these news releases saying, oh, you know, Francis Jolov is on this trip. Um, but so even when she wasn't physically present and hadn't been around for weeks, she gets press and, and sometimes Maria and Ingeborg would not be even mentioned. Um, so that might have been, that may, might have made me a little cranky. I don't know about you. And it might even have made me I don't know, send press releases to Swedish language newspapers describing the trip, but leaving out any reference to Sarah and Francis, mentioning only Maria and Ingeborg, which is exactly what ends up happening. I was able to find in Swedish language newspapers, uh, you know, articles like this. And uh, here it says, you know, Miss Ingeborg Ginstead is out traveling in a petition car across the country. Um, she departed from San Francisco. And um, here's, this is in Kansas City. Um, and she's the president of the Women's Political Equality League in Providence, Rhode Island. Her girlfriend bought the automobile and she and Ms. Jinstead are traveling, bringing with them a petition about amending the constitution. And, um, you know, so there's no mention at all of Sarah or uh, Francis Joliffe. So, um, and this, I was only able to find a handful of, um, of existing or extant uh, Swedish language newspapers um, from the route that they took, but, but uh, I thought this was quite funny. I had somebody translate this for me. <clears throat> the other thing I had them do is uh, meet with historical figures along the way. Uh, Joe Hill is one example of this. Um, he was a famous uh, industrial workers of the world activist uh, and a songwriter who was in fact imprisoned outside of Salt Lake City when they came through, he was just weeks away from being executed for a murder. Many believed he didn't commit one that he'd been framed for so they could just simply get rid of him. Um, the, the authorities who, who were tired of his needling them about labor. He was a fellow Swede. And I, I think that Ingeborg certainly would have known his story and would have wanted to see him. And so I, I have her meet with him in prison as she comes through Salt Lake City. Um, and the IWW was known to be more inclusive as a labor union, it accepted black members and its members spoke different languages. And I imagine that Ingeborg believes in equality and is frustrated that they weren't meeting with black suffragists as they came across the country. So she and Maria also meet with Ida B. Wells Barnett, who is this amazing journalist, suffragist and anti-lynching activist who lived in Chicago. And then um, finally, another person that I have them meet with is Clarence Darrow. Um, it's, it's this kind of weird fact that Sarah Bardfield's older sister, Mary, had been his lover for many years. So Sarah did actually know him. And, um, it, and 
he turns out to be a bit of a disappointment for Ingeborg. He's not quite as supportive as a suffrage as, as she wanted him to, to be. By the way, the book includes an afterword where I attempt to separate fact from fiction. Uh, I, I, that was a useful exercise for me because as I, as I continued to fictionalize the story, I started losing track of what was actually true. Um, when I did my trip in 2015, Donald Trump hadn't yet become the Republican nominee for president, although he was getting a lot of attention. Still, as I came across the country, there was a lot of hope that Hillary Clinton would be the country's first woman president. And as I was working on the book before and after Trump was elected, there was a tremendous amount of anti-immigrant, anti-labor, racist and misogynistic sentiment being promoted by Trump and his supporters. My research was showing me that 1915 looked a hell of a lot like 2015, which I found really frightening. So I ended up weaving a lot of that into the book as well. Um, I, and I wanna to talk to about the petitions a little bit more, which are such a big part of the story. For me, they're a potent symbol of how long and hard women had to work to win voting rights and of how uncertain the future of the movement was for these suffragists in 1915. The petitions also remind us that as frustrating as it must have been for them, in the US, the suffragists, the suffrage protests were always peaceful, not like January 6th here in this country. And, as Ingeborg reflects on the petitions in the book, it occurred to her that the pages of all the many petitions gathered over decades from white women and colored from Eastern or Western states by Susan B. Anthony and countless others would stretch for hundreds of miles. And every page would have carried the hopes and dreams of both the signers and the collectors. What a wretched waste of time it all had been, she thought suddenly angry. Surely the generations of women who had worked so hard to reach this moment could have set their hands to some better purpose. How many more petitions would be required to end this one battle? And so this petitions weave through different groups of women over time and ultimately become the road under the wheels of Amelia in the illustration that Emma designed for the cover of the book. So this is a book about a journey on many levels. Uh, the 1915 trip itself, the journey the suffrage movement took to where it was in 1915, the journeys the individual participants took, how it changed them, and it did change them um, in material ways, I think. And though I'm not in the story, it reflects my own journey, which I'm still on, and understanding this history and its connections to the present. So, um, these are the fabulous four, <laughs> as I call them. Um, I think at the end of the trip, you can just see how, how baked they all look. They just, uh, Mabel Vernon later said that her health never really recovered from this trip. Um, if you don't know the language of the 19th Amendment, uh, which ultimately, through which women did, or most women did ultimately win the right to vote, the right of the citizens of the United States to vote shall not be denied or abridged by the United States or by any states on account of sex. From the Seneca Falls Convention, it was 72 years to get this language into the US Constitution. Unbelievable. And, um, and this is a quote that I love from Alice Paul. She says, I never doubted that equal rights was the right direction. Most reforms, most problems are complicated, but to me, there is nothing complicated about ordinary equality. So this is my contact information. Uh, thanks for coming on this journey with me. I, I think we can, uh, I'll stop sharing my screen and we can go to Q&A. Thank you. Oh, I, I'm having trouble hearing you at this point. That's because I had myself muted. Of course. <laughs> I think by now I'd get it. <laughs> um, thank you for that. You know, I just want to um, link to uh where people can buy the book all right yep um i'm sure that your local bookstore can order the book but um you know i believe it is available on ingram that should be how i purchased it yeah uh, and I'll, I'll put in the chat um main authors publishing is where um is the publisher that i used and and um so i i can get link you directly to their website as well if you it's also on Amazon, but I know that not everybody likes to use Amazon. 
yes, you know, I had some wonderful conversations with the local bookstore just around the corner from me at Mechanics Institute, Alexander Books, and the owner there, she told me how much of a difference it makes when you buy a book from a local bookstore. It really, really does, you know, keep them afloat. And Alexander Books can send you books within 72 hours, uh, which rivals Amazon Prime. So anyway, that's my plug for local bookstores. That's absolutely great. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, I have a lot of questions for you regarding your writing process, but I wanted, before we get to that, I wanted to um, ask if anyone has any questions. We, we're a small enough group, you can just turn your mic on and ask Anne directly. Um, well, I will ask a warm up question then. Um, did you mention, Anne, the sources that you used for this book? Was I hope you found a diary or something really juicy. Well, uh, yeah, I actually flew out to California and uh, to the um, uh, Huntington Library. And that has um, Charles Erston Scott Wood's papers, or at least a big chunk of them, including the correspondence between um, Erskine and, and Sarah. And so I, I read uh, her letters there. It's also possible to get um, the National Women's Party papers. The, the Congressional Union becomes the National Women's Party, so that's how they're often referenced. But their uh, their, their papers are, are um, held at the um, Library of Congress. And, and um, so you can, but there are affiliate libraries that have microfilm. And so I was able to get those, the relevant microfilm, you, know, you can request it by time periods, shipped up to Portland, Maine and, and, um, and look at the microfilm in the library there. And uh, so that allowed me to look at all the correspondence that was happening. Um, uh, you know, between various members of the of the planning team for this trip, um, and and leading up to it and during it, and as then I guess that the other two big sources were the suffragists because they were talking about the planning for the trip, um, and then and then the you know what was happening during the trip as they were heading across the country, and then newspaper articles. Wonderful. It looks like Sherry has a question. Sherry, do you want to ask directly or do you want me to read it to you? Read it aloud. Uh, please read it because I'm actually in my dog's vet's office. <laughs> so please read it. Thank you. Hi, okay. Bye. Um, so Sherry wonders, do you know where the petition is today? Because in the book you say they were lost. Yes, interesting question. Um, it's true. Uh, I was never able to find the petitions. I, I thought for sure they would exist in the, the National Archives or Library somewhere. Uh, no. Uh, and, you know, I have my own suppositions about that. I mean, I, I think, um, you know, they do get kind of lost in the book and, and uh, or there's this sort of like kerfluffle around how do we know there were 500,000 signatures? Who counted that? Well, it was Alice Paul who counted it. And you start seeing this correspondence go flying back and forth between uh, Mabel and the, the team that was still at the Panama Pacific and their sort of headquarters in DC saying, where are the petitions? And we don't have them. And, and um, so I, uh, I think they really did have to sort of pull something together for that final, um, you know, the final event they have in DC and, and just must have been desperately hoping that nobody would call their bluff. But I mean, new report, they were saying that it was, you know, the length of a football field or several foot or miles long. I mean, it just, it, it was crazy. You would think that uh, a petition that was that long would be enormous. And, and certainly it would be problematic to have it in their car with them, especially with no, no top or anything like that, you know, ex exposed to the weather. Um, so I think it's likely they did, you know, ship some on ahead and maybe became parted with it. But another time they say, oh, well, we actually had a duplicate copy. What's like, nobody believes that, you know, that you had a duplicate copy of all these signatures. I just, I don't believe it. And um, so, 
uh, anyway, I, yeah, that's, it, it's funny that as central as they were to the whole trip and the, the purpose of the trip that, you know, they almost, that almost ends up being this huge problem for them. Um, okay, I have another question. So I enjoyed hearing your rationale for not writing a traditional historical hist history of this road trip, but making it into a novel. Um, did you, what were the, the major roadblocks of choosing this, this path of, of fictionalizing it? Well, never having written a novel before <laughs> was definitely one of them. Uh, you know, I've, I've had my own business since 93 and uh, a lot of it has been federal grant writing for nonprofit and government clients. And I, I, I had this sort of mantra that I told my clients for years, I don't write fiction. So when it comes to these, these grants, we're gonna create a business plan, you know, I'm not going to make it up. You know, you, you have to really think through how you're going to do this business. And uh, so, uh, you know, I, I had almost overcome that mindset of like, I, I don't write fiction. And um, and and I, I wanted to footnote everything when I first started writing it. And, and I uh, so it took me a long time to get comfortable with the idea of, of writing fiction and and um, and giving myself permission to make up the things that I I needed to make up in order to to um, you know to, to have the story make sense and um, I I think I also um, I was worried that it was going to be way too grim because I was in a really grim mood <laughs> in um, you know during the Trump administration I'll be honest with you and and I, I and uh, so I I I felt like I just I wanted to expose all the terrible things that were happening around them at the time you know. And then I thought, well, people are going to want to read this. It's going to just bum them out. So I, I tried to sort of uh, lighten it up at, at, at intervals. And, and um, that was a little bit uh, tricky for me. But like the, the meeting with a spiritualist uh, or the, the seance that they go to, um, you know, spiritualists were actually some of the early suffragists. They they had power. They could speak. Um, and uh, and. So I, I thought it was important to kind of highlight that little bit of, of suffrage history, um, but it was also meant in part to just kind of lighten things up a little bit. That's interesting. Some of the uh, the Mechanics Institute, for example, hosted several spiritualists um, who came and gave, they were on the lecture circuit and they came and gave talks. And uh, I found it interesting that, you know, many of them were into you know, women's rights and free love and as well as the spiritual component. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's the cool thing about uh, researching this history is that there was uh, just so much of what we sort of take for granted today was was present um, then, you know, 100 years ago, over 100 years ago. I mean, there were there were plenty of lesbians and you know gay and lesbian people around. There was plenty of uh, sort of non-traditional uh, kind of behavior going on. And uh, it just, it wasn't as, certainly wasn't as well accepted and people had to be a little quiet about it. But, but um, you know, there was all this really cool stuff and you could see this kind of through line uh, right up to the present. It maybe wasn't written about in the news, but <laughs> in the yeah. newspapers, but it was being talked about. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was being acted out. I mean, I, and I, I mean, one, one regret that I have is that there was all this in, um, in New York City, there was this whole like enclave of, of super cool, you know, literary people and activists and gay and lesbians and just like this. And I, I mean, I, I had sort of thought that I would have them get drawn into that in some ways, but I just, I couldn't really figure out how to make that happen. And I decided it was just too much of a rabbit hole, but I mean, I would have been nice to highlight that, I, I think, you know, cause I think there, there really is, uh, it didn't just like suddenly spontaneously happen and, you know, 10 years ago or something. Right. Maybe that's the subject of your next book. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I have another question. How long did this project take you? Like from the moment your curiosity was peaked to the time when you're, you know, ready to publish it? 
Well, it was a long time. I mean, because I, I as I said, I, I learned about it as I was researching my first book, which itself took me 15 years to write. I mean, I was like r- raising a family and, you know, and working at a, bu- a busy consulting business. I mean, it was, I, there was a lot of distractions. And um, so w- in my first book, and so that it took me, and I just wasn't really sure that the, you know, that I was going to actually pull it off until my mom finally said to me, I'm not going to live forever. You need to finish this book because uh, she was Florence's granddaughter. And, and so, uh, but I, I always said, I, I wanted to, I wanted to retrace the route of their, this 1915 trip, but I couldn't do it. I wouldn't let myself do it until I finished my first book, which I finally did in 2014. And then, um, you know, I was my mom's executor and there was a bunch of state stuff I had to deal with. And, but I finally realized now I can do it. Like now is a really good time to, for me to take that trip. And, and so I, I gave myself a year to uh, plan what I called my sabbatical. And I, I took about 10 weeks to, to make the trip. And I, I see my um, husband's cousins, Marion has been on the call. And, and, um, and I started out in San Francisco staying with her. And, um, and that was just invaluable for me. She just completely uh, oriented me in the right direction for uh, thinking about this whole project, and and uh, and as, as she herself has been a long life, long you know, uh, uh, an activist throughout her life, as w- were her parents. So, uh, so anyway, that was that was super cool. And and so then I then I thought I was going to write my original plan was to write a nonfiction book, and I thought I would do that. And I, but then I really wanted to write it from Ingeborg and Maria's perspective, and I just couldn't find out enough information about them. So it took me a long time to let go of that and just, and then I ran for state representative in 2018, and that was another distraction. So, you know, just like one thing after another. And the problem with me is I'm, I'm, it's really hard for me to keep my butt in a chair and write because I'm, I'm kind of an activist. I actually like to get out and do stuff. So There's no need to apologize. I mean, all of these experiences and time that passes helps age the wine and make it wonderful. So um, really, that's how creativity matures and grows and um, and refines itself. So, no, take all the time you need. (laughs) Yeah, I mean, that's kind of what I figured in the end, too. I mean, and I, I was it's a much better book for me having taken the time to really understand all that was going on. And I, I mean, you asked earlier about, uh, you know, my other sources and I did a, a quite an extensive reading into early 20th century history and, uh, you know, stuff about Darrow, stuff about the labor movement, uh, you know, all kinds of different things. And, and um, uh, so, so that all kind of went into the hopper. Yeah. You know, there's, there's a wonderful book called the past is a foreign country. And that is so true. And you have to learn you know, the language, the culture, the, the customs, like you have to learn all of that, even though you think, oh, well, I haven't lived through it, but I've learned from it. And you really haven't until you've di- dove in, dived in, uh, immersed yourself in, in that time period, the place and all of that. Um, that's what's going to help make your book wonderful. Yeah, and I think that, I mean, the other thing is that once you sort of built that scaffold in a way, I mean, then, then you just complete, you know, continue adding to it and, it, and, uh, and it really gets fun. I mean, I, I was never an expert in earlier 20th century history, really, until I started all this, uh, and I'm still probably not compared to real historians, um, but I, uh, you know, I, I've learned a tremendous amount about it, and I now I just love reading about. It. I just read a big biography of of, Pres- of Woodrow Wilson, um, and uh, I thought it was fascinating. And one of the things that was clear was, like in the suffrage movement, he was the target in the later years of the campaign. Those last six years, say, um, he was such he was such a focus of the suffragists because they were trying to move him to over to support the federal amendment. And um, but in this biography you know, the women hardly even get a mention. I mean, you know, it's like maybe a total of a couple pages. He just doesn't really, you know, he's, he's not a big, it was not a big focus of his. And uh, it just was interesting to see that um, sort of disparity. Mm-hmm. Does anyone else have any questions that they'd like to ask Anne? You can see I have I have uh, Ingeborg here behind me. Um, this is a, a cutout that I had done, and uh, when I can start making uh, making in person presentations again, she's going to 
come around with me. She's wonderful, although she does look a little tired. <laughs> she does look kind of grumpy, doesn't she? <laughs> yeah, I know it. It's true. I, I, uh, but I, I think it's it's good to get her out and about. She needs a little bit more recognition. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Um, and what what outfit would she be wearing today? I wonder. Yeah, I know. <laughs> That's not my choice to wear of clothes to wear on a on a road trip <laughs> these days. Yeah, I think they wore those kind of dusty jackets. You know, dust. They were what are they called dust covers or something like that. That's kind of what they were. But I mean, hers actually did uh, button down the front, and but she also had a way to button it. Um, into pantaloons, kind of these loose pantaloons, so that she could work under the car uh, and preserve her modesty. Fascinating. Yeah. <laughs> There's a reason for all those buttons, then, huh? <laughs> yeah, that's right. Little tidbits. Well, there weren't zippers in those days, that's for sure. <laughs> well, Anne, I want to thank you for this um, fascinating treatment, and I look. I'm sorry, I haven't read the book yet, but I look forward to reading it. And I want to compliment you again on the cover, your daughter's cover. It's fantastic. Um, and I, you know, it just is one of those covers that encourages one to read the book. So um, tell her I said that it was great. <laughs> Thank you so much. She'll be delighted to hear that. Yeah, she, she did a great job with it. It was fun to work with her on it. She's a, she's a, uh, you know, a, part-time practicing artist. So who knows, maybe she'll do some other book covers. All right. Well, I want to thank you for taking the time to talk with us and share with us um, your, your writing journey and um, the journey of these uh, women. Um, and thanks everyone for attending. And I hope you all have a safe and healthy uh, fall. Yeah. Stay safe, everyone. Take care. All right. Have a great afternoon. Bye-bye. Yep. Bye-bye.